Um, it gives me great pleasure to be here uh, this morning and present this lecture to you. And uh, hopefully the technology will work. Yeah. Thank you. They tell me water and computer, they don't like each other. So we're going to test that this morning. Do you want me to take it away? No, it's all right. It's, it's uh, right, the topic I want to focus this morning is called Haptically Enabled Virtual Reality System. Uh, my life in the area of uh, computer simulation and uh, modeling and simulation it started uh, in mid-80s when I was doing my research at Durham University. And uh, then I was creating a computer model, uh, virtual model for factory simulation and so on. Around uh, late 80s, uh, when I used to approach companies, ask them, uh, would you sponsor my research? Would you give me money to create a virtual factory for you guys uh, to analyze uh, the uh, operations of a factory? They used to tell me, yes, Saeed, we will give you virtual money to do your virtual simulation. Years has passed now. I think virtual reality is a very hot topic now. I don't think people, uh, you know, would say those kind of things. Right. Uh, the outline of my presentation is I'm going to talk about uh, VR, AR devices, haptic devices, and uh, a little bit about games engine, and then show you a whole series of case studies. So first few slides, uh, I will uh, fly through quickly. So I also want to acknowledge uh, all of the fundings that uh, we receive. When I say uh, we, uh, I have around uh, just over 100 researchers in my team, and all the hard work my researchers they do, and the funding comes from various organizations around the world. Uh, this is a single slide around VR, AR, haptics. I'm trying to capture uh, what sort of tools and techniques we use, what sort of devices we have developed and we have integrated, and what kind of applications. So VR, AR devices, as you already know, some of the hot devices there out there, HTC Vive, uh, then you have Oculus Rift, and then PlayStation VR. Uh, in front of every picture, uh, uh, there is a, a character A1, A2, A3. And uh, the reason being, because right at the end of my presentation, I acknowledge where uh, I have uh, taken the images from. So there is a whole list of websites and uh, references. So the top line there, they are what we call it desktop uh, devices, meaning that these devices, they are connected to some sort of computers and so on. Whereas the devices at the bottom, uh, you actually insert a mobile phone of some sort or some sort of devices, and they are not desktop, so they are more mobile. Now, let's look at HTC Vive. Uh, I'm sure many of you would have played with these devices and uh, developed by HTC and Valve, and uh, it can, uh, the uh, work envelope for these devices, they are around just under five meters, 4.6 meters by 4.6 meters. And they have two lighthouses, and uh, it, there's all kind of trackings and so on. And games developers, they use this. Then you have Oculus Rift, and um, again, a different type of device. Uh, the headset this time emits rays and so on. Uh, whereas the other one, the base station uh, emits uh, rays. And the work envelope workspace for this one is a bit smaller. It's one, one and a half meters by 3.3 meters. Then we have a whole series of uh, games engine. There are many of them on the market. If you are into VR, AR, games development, you would have seen. Uh, I will tell you exactly how many there are there, but uh, I've put some of the most famous one there. Uh, so this is a software framework designed for creation and development of video games, uh, VR, AR training simulation uh, for console, mobile, and devices and PCs. So you have CryEngine, Unreal, and Unity. Uh, the core functionalities of a game engine 
They do rendering, uh, they have rendering engine for 3D and 2D graphics, physics engine, uh, sound, so you get those kind of music and sound effect, scripting, animation, AI, networking, memory management, threading, uh, uh, localization, and cinematic type of effects. And uh, there are many games engine out there. And I think the wiki lists around 176 of them as of 2017. And, uh, and they are for various purposes and the price brackets, they are all different. And obviously I'm not supporting any company or any organization. I've just selected three that we have some experience with and the ones that we use. Um, and, and that's why I'm, I've put up these three. Um, so key aspect of a, a great uh, game engine is visual rendering quality. Uh, and then completed flexible production pipeline, updates uh, with latest technology and research, and then you have the whole ecosystem and cost. The top three, in my opinion, they are Unreal, Unity, and CryEngine. Uh, so uh, Unreal uh, considered the most uh, successful video game engine and developed by Epic Games. It was showcased in 1998, first time. And the current version is 4.16.2. And then, in terms of detail, I won't go, you can uh, download the slides and you will see some of the specs if you wanted to use or if you wanted to compare one against uh, another. I've tried to make your life easy for you to put all the information uh, and their analysis here. Uh, and some of the highlights uh, for uh, Unreal, Visual Studio integration and C++ hot reloading, and uh, VFX uh, particle systems, physics X integration, and so on. Then we have Unity, which is a, a different games engine, and uh, first published in 2005 on Mac, and uh, uh, support multiple programming languages such as C Sharp, JavaScript, and Boo, and has uh, several capabilities. And again, uh, it's details I've put up there in terms of a uh, list of supported SDK features and so on. Then we have CryEngine. Um, this, is, uh, this one is developed by German developer Crytek, and um, again, is a uh, the very, very capable uh, games engine, um, and that's a superb job. And again, there are uh, highlights, uh, DirectX 12, physics-based rendering, real-time dynamic water, uh, tessellation, and so on, and 3D HDR lens flares, and so on. So that was uh, some background in terms of games engine, because later on you will see that uh, a lot of research we do, a lot of application we have developed, we use different types of games, engine, devices, and so on. So we develop uh, novel algorithms, uh, and then we try to develop novel demonstration. And I'll show it to you that what they are, and uh, when we know, we sense that there is a novelty there, then we quickly patent it. And we have several patents uh, in this space. Uh, when I say we have several uh, patents, is in the area of haptically enabled certain things, whether it is medical simulation or motion platforms and so on. Uh, and uh, uh, one application, let me go through some of the applications for you. So a uh, uh, automotive company, a joint, automa uh, joint automotive company approached us and they asked us, can you come up with a uh, desktop training tool for our general assembly operators? So this is back in 2008, 2009. Okay, so it's not new technology. Then it was revolutionary that to develop a, uh, both a mobile and desktop trainer uh, com uh, combining virtual reality and haptics and motion tracking to immerse a general assembly operator to put parts of an engine or put parts of a car, in this case is a cockpit of a car, together. And the reason being that uh, if you are an uh, automotive manufacturer, um, if you are manufacturing cars, you have high runners and then you have low runners. 
higher earners, they are the cheaper car that they manufacture by tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. And then you have low runner. Those are the ones that rich people, they want to drive. They are highly specialized. Uh, they have certain features which cheaper cars they don't have. And therefore, they are not assembled that often. Since they are not assembled, how do you provide the training to assembly operators not to, pay, not to make mistakes? So you don't want, for example, to pay a large sum of money for a car and then your windows start leaking or your electric uh, windows, you know, malfunctioning. And you can't say because we, since we haven't uh, assembled that many of this particular variants, therefore our assembly operators, uh, the chance of them making mistake is much higher. You, can, you know, that's not acceptable. So we came up uh, with a system, as you can see in the center of the uh, slide, uh, and this is a, a desktop uh, variant uh, that you put a head-mounted display on, HMD, and then you can see it in 3D, and you can track the object in 3D, and then you can go through a series of menus, and then you can grasp the uh, part subassembly uh, with your hand, and then a haptic device is used, so it gives you that force reflection into your hand. Haptic devices, they are force reflective devices. And then you go through the, your assembly process, and then your performance is measured by how of uh, how quickly you can assemble and whether you have achieved the sequence of assembly in a correct manner or not. We also developed on the right hand side of the screen uh, a uh, mobile version a, uh, inside the Pelican case. Uh, we have put everything and uh, you can transport it from place to place. So uh, we run uh, lots of experimentation and we, we have learned, we discovered a few things that was in 2009, which I will come to that in a minute. And then another adjacent to that project was, we were asked, can you um, uh, model viscoelastic material for us? Uh, with uh, aircraft and automotives, you have hydraulic hoses, or you have uh, electrical cables, or you have leather, uh, or any other types of viscoelastic materials. Now, to create a virtual part and be able to handle that virtual part and then test it, we call it uh, the, uh, the virtual assembly and virtual testing. And using a haptic device, you can actually uh, manipulate virtual object. Obviously, you have to first create it, the uh, engine inside with allow, which uh, it allows you to create that viscoelastic part. You can change the properties of that material dynamics, dynamically, and then you can actually interact with it. Here, for example, you want to route a cable or hydraulic, hydraulic hose, and you want to decide where to put the particular clips and so on. And also, you want to see how often uh, uh, you could do this without injuring a person. What is the uh, way, the best way of assembly uh, process uh, and movement of your arms and upper torso and so on. So uh, then as uh, uh, that was taking place behind the scene, the system actually captures the data and analyzes it. And then we discovered a few things. Uh, we had given the system to uh, non-gamers and gamers, and uh, we, uh, what we found out then, non-gamers, uh, they performed the task as instructed, and they, they performed a much better job. And uh, because they were told to do it in a particular way, there was no preconceived, you know, the system has to work in this way, in that way, the menu should be here, and so on. Gamers performed the task uh, as per their interpretation of the game. So that was the, uh, uh, this was around 2008, 2009, okay? And then we learned our lesson. We say if game industry creating all these games and people, they have certain expectation and they interpret things in a particular way, maybe we should, as engineers and scientists, we should gamify and then use those techniques, what gamers they are used to, and therefore, to use those techniques to actually transfer the knowledge, what we call knowledge capture and knowledge transfer. So we, you could say we learned it the hard way, but now at least we have learned. Um, so that was uh, one example. Another example, again, 
using VR and uh, uh, this one is pure VR. Uh, uh, in, in the area of uh, uh, contamination where you have biological, radiological, and uh, people they have been exposed because of whatever reason, they are doing cleanup, they have to handle, wh whatever the, uh, the reason may be. You have to decontaminate. So we looked at uh, and uh, worked on this project, how we can decontaminate uh, people, uh, equipment, and vehicles. And as it happens, this one is a picture of a military vehicle. Uh, so we had to actually uh, develop various types of uh, uh, nozzles uh, in the virtual world and the way the spraying happens. And then we had to actually also to look at how these spray actually hit the particular object and the level of uh, the decontamination and coverage. It's not a simple task. If you go to details of some of these things, you will see. So here we use Unity 3D, Physics X, and high-level shading language, HLSL, and the Connect device. And as you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, it shows that which type of uh, um, nozzle we have used uh, with which type of spray patterns and so on, uh, and uh, how long it takes to actually do the coverage of uh, that particular area. Okay, that was the decontamination. Let me move to something else. Uh, how many of you have gone to an, uh, uh, seen an uh, optometrist? Maybe the majority of you guys. I think uh, if you haven't, most probably you have 20-20 vision. Maybe otherwise you have zero, zero vision. In fact, even you don't know. <laughs> So at some stage in our life, we will go to an optometrist and they put this, this slit lamp, they look inside your eyes, they feel the pressure on the surface of your eyes. And uh, if you are working using certain types of uh, uh, machinery, uh, say angle grinders, foreign object normally land onto your eyes if you don't have protective eyewear gears and so on. And eventually you have to go and somebody has to remove that foreign object. All right? But just imagine that. If that person comes with a needle close to your eyes, say, I've never done this before. I've tested it on an orange, but not on a real eye. All right? You're my first patient. Let me approach with a needle into your eyes. Would you allow that person to do that? No way. So. We said, okay, we develop haptic technology, we develop these physics engine, and why we don't combine and then use traditional devices which they have, these particular slit lamp. We instrument it instead of having a person head inside this, uh, uh, behind this slit lamp, uh, we create a virtual head, virtual eye, and then we use a haptic device which is on bottom right hand, hand side of the screen, and then haptic device is the needle, and as you are injecting into the virtual eye, you can feel it. So if there is a foreign object there, you can approach it and then remove. So that was the project. I'm gonna show you some slides. So as the uh, slit lamp is moved, the aperture we can control, you can see inside the virtual eye, and you can see a foreign object, and the person by holding a haptic device can approach this virtual eye, can feel uh, the surface of the vir uh, this virtual eye, and as it's uh, applying uh, pressure on that needle to the surface of the eye, as actually will feed. So we use uh, both eye surgeon and optometrists uh, to tell us the amount of force that we are generating is realistic, because uh, if devices they are not uh, calibrated and validated by experts, really they are no good. So. This particular project, uh, uh, we call it haptically enabled optometry uh, training simulator. Uh, I'm going forward, I'm back, medical and military. Um, so this one uh, is uh, for a person uh, trying to learn how to use a gun and, uh, and uh, uh, to increase the accuracy of the way you hold, the way you breathe, and uh, the way you actually hitting your target and so on. Again, uh, 
uh, we have demonstrated using a haptic device uh, and the, the, uh, some sort of handheld device, in this case is a pistol of some sort, and then you hold it and then uh, when you fire, you can feel the recoil. And as, he, as that's happening, your hand might move initially and then as you become better and better, the movement and uh, wandering of your hand becomes less and less. Uh, and again, this was a project that uh, was very successful. Let me go to a medical. So there was a gun, this time it is a needle. Now, I don't want to ask how many of you have had a collapsed lung, but you know that if somebody has a collapsed lung, it is a serious business, serious procedure, and the way this procedure happens, a person, an expert, whatever doctor, paramedics, or whatever, they come with a needle, and from the front of your chest cavity, they go in between the rib cage number two and three, and then if it is from the side, they go between five and six. So again, if you have never done it, if you ask to tell the person, I'm gonna do this, most probably the person hardly can breathe, or lack of it, then they say, yeah, go, go ahead and do it. Uh, maybe this one is uh, more convincing if you didn't use such a thing. But having the technology, it actually can help the training uh, paramedics and doctors. Again, using a haptic device, and then we had to uh, create models. So here there are different layers. You have a skin, uh, and then you have flesh, and you have bones. They all behave differently. Uh, so we have parallel worlds here, and creating uh, uh, the, the model, and then uh, using a haptic device to reinflate uh, the lungs. So th this is a medical pre uh, application. And uh, since the time is short, I will not run all of the videos. And if you went to our website, you can download all of these videos and you can see in detail. So this is another medical application I will fly through and I want to show you something totally different. Firefighting. The majority of firefighters, they learn how to fight a fire using some sort of liquid foams and so on. And they actually use the real, real thing. So they, they go through their training, a mock-up fire, a real hose, real branch, they drag it and they are wearing all of the protective gears and they fight the fire. So we said, okay, again, haptics, VR, AR. Why don't we combine all this technology and create the world's first haptically enabled hot fire training system? And that's what we have done. So it is a real branch, but it is sensorized, all right? And real hose, no water in it. It gets inflated and then uh, it is haptically enabled, has a motor and so on. So when you pull the branch uh, and you want to create various uh, water fog pattern and so on, you feel the reaction force. And you feel the jet reaction, you feel the uh, drag forces of the hose. Uh, and then we have created a uh, vest which gets hot so we can dial the temperature so you can really feel the heat of the fire and we have uh, modeled the smokes and water and so on. And we have combined the whole technology um, and that's what it is about. If the technology allows me sometime with this new Mac, I lose my mouse. It gets hungry and goes for a piece of cheese. Um, okay. Uh, here we are. This is a short video clip of what I've just explained. <coughs> so uh, the person wear all of the protective gears, but some of it is modified. You will see by the time this guy finishes, he is really uh, all heated up and sweating and so on. So you have your oxygen tank again, and then the device wearing, it is a computer, and then uh, the weight of it is very similar to uh, your um, oxygen tank. And as you can see, as he uh, is trying to put the fire out, uh, the hose pulls him back. And the forces is very large that uh, we can dial it, so two people, they have to stand behind each other to hold. 
uh, and um, and obviously the devil is in the details that how do you model the water, how do you model the fire, how do you put the fire out, and so on. Uh, but it is a mobile system, you can take it on a ship, you can take it on a building, you can take it anywhere, and you can train people. Now, the beauty of it is that you don't use water, you don't use foam, you don't contaminate, you know, environment, uh, and is, you know, environmentally free, uh, green uh, and friendly. And you don't need to ha create an entire infrastructure and every few days to sit in on fire and to put people inside to actually fight fires. Since, again, time is short, I'm just going to fast forward and then you guys can again go to our website and download it. Uh, okay. Now, uh, I have perhaps another two examples for you. One is uh, what I've called the haptically enabled universal motion simulator. And uh, the idea here is that it is not just any simulator, it is a universal one. So you can use it for land vehicle, air vehicle, or sea vehicles. And then it is uh, haptically enabled. It gives you force feedback, whether it is steering, whether it is collective and cyclic, if you want to fly uh, aircraft. And since it is a giant industrial robot, robotic arm, in terms of its accuracy, repeatability, and ruggedness, is far better than traditional motion platforms because these kind of systems, they are manufactured in large quantity and they are expected to run 24 hours a day in production lines. So uh, what we have done here, again, combining uh, virtual reality uh, and backdrive the robot to create a simulator. Uh, my mouse gone again, hungry, and... Uh, I will run a short video for you. Only first few seconds of it. Maybe we need the sound system on this one. Uh, now, before we start, a viewer warning. If you're a high-tech junkie who gets jealous watching someone else enjoy the latest and greatest thrill ride, look away now. This is part of a catalyst program. It's not the video we have made. It's a TV program. Chopper, or a fighter aircraft, and go into battle. You gotta check out this. He's standing in the base of one of my robots. It's called the Universal Motion Simulator, or UMS. Where a pilot is perched on a seven meter long robotic arm, capable of exerting up to six Gs of force. That is impressive. The man at the controls of this next generation motion simulator is Professor Saeed Nahavandi. Ah, <laughs> that was fantastic. You survived. Yeah, absolutely, yes. This is an amazing... You can watch that later. <laughs> right, so that uh, you can do many things with this system, and we have several versions of this, uh, and uh, land vehicle, air vehicle, and sea vehicle, and you don't get motion sickness. So the trick with this thing is that creating all of the washout filters, and then you can do something called upset training, meaning acrobatic type maneuvers, to do acrobatic type maneuvers, the traditional simulators, they use uh, visual cues to fool your brain that you are doing total inversion. And therefore you get motion sickness. Since we can turn the body in space and then we can do infinite rotation on three axes, axis one, axis four, and axis six, the person does not get motion sickness. Therefore you can provide a much higher level of um, a training. I said I have two, but I had three. So maybe I'll skip this one. So this one is world's first haptically enabled teleoperative uh, sonography. So the robot with the ultrasound, remotely we deploy it from 2,000 kilometers away. We can touch and feel and do sonography. All right? So the idea is that you deploy it in rural and regional places around the world. So you don't need a radiologist or sonographer to be next to the patient. And again, we have a video and through ABC television and so on. Uh, but uh, the very last one is, I don't know how many of you, you have been exposed to robotic surgery, minimally invasive surgical system. There are several of those. And the, the, I won't name, uh, there, are, there are robots out there. Now, none of those robots, they have force feedback capabilities. 
to the best of my knowledge. So they use visual servoing. Okay, so minimally invasive surgical system, they, have, they are far superior than traditional uh, surgery, uh, surgical techniques uh, for post-operation uh, recovery and so on. But if, you, if a surgeon changed their gloves, you gave them a different glove, they say, oh, I cannot feel it now, you know, the texture, the way I was feeling. Here yet, all of the latest technology available in terms of surgical system, minimally invasive surgical system, they don't give you that sense of touch. So what we have done, we have put sense of touch on those robots. So we have um, uh, created a system uh, combining uh, robotics and haptics and teleoperation uh, where a surgeon can remotely touch and feel the patient from a long distance. So uh, uh, again, the robot can be any robot, and uh, this was launched at a, uh, one of the simulation conferences in Australia. And uh, you see three robots there, and they, uh, the surgeon is operating those robotic arms, and where his hand goes in, that is our worldwide patent. We call it multi-point haptics. Uh, but what it sits on is a commercial device, okay? Uh, so commercial device that sits there, the gray one, uh, it provides single point uh, force feedback, but where his hand goes in is our invention, multi-point haptics. And obviously it's connected all the way to instrument, and then whatever instrument can touch and feel, the surgeon remotely can touch and feel. With that, I stop. Again, if you are interested in that, you can go to our website and download more information. In conclusion, test before you invest, practice before you perform, and experiment before you experience. <laughs> and these are a list of publications. I wow. acknowledge all of the list of uh, uh, references, sorry, references, and these yeah. are some of our sample publications from our website. Yes. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Maybe. Yeah.